Well, we come back this evening to the letter of James. We've looked at uh, most of chapter 1 thus far. We've looked at the origin of sin and how sin develops and progresses in the soul, in the life of anybody and the end product of it, which is death. This is the worst of life. This is the most evil of things, of course, to be um, entrapped in sin. That's how we all are in our nature. But if we stay like that, death is the end. Separation from God. Ruin and misery, as the old writers used to put it, in hell forever. So the origin of sin. Satan, of course, but our own selves and our own desires for that which opposes the righteousness and holiness of God. So that's where sin and death comes from, but what about the good things, the blessings? Verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So every good gift, every perfect gift, comes down from the Father of lights, from God in heaven. And we looked last week also at verse 18, the, the best of all blessings of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's talking about the new birth, regeneration, a bit more technical kind of term, to be born again, to have that spiritual life put into us that we don't have by nature, whereby we realize the truth and the reality of the spiritual realm. We feel the power of God's word when it accuses us for our sin and we rejoice when we see that God has given us a remedy and a way to himself through the death and the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we're born again, when that spiritual life is put within us, we do admit our sin, we rush to Christ and we believe upon him and everything starts all over again. And it's the most wonderful of blessings and it's the most important of blessings to seek and to find from God. And where does that leave us? Well, there's always a wherefore or a therefore in the word of God. James does this, Paul does it all the time. He gives us doctrine, he tells us something and then there's a wherefore or a therefore that follows. In other words, because that's true, something should follow. There's a consequence of that. You need to understand what I've been teaching you and you need to realize that what I've been teaching you, if it's true for you, demands, requires a response. Because this is true, therefore do this. Because you understand this, therefore live in this kind of way. And this is what James brings to us this, in, in this passage this evening. Speaking about God's good and perfect gifts in verse 17, the greatest of them, the new birth in verse 18. Verse 19, the wherefore. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. There could be all kinds of things. Wherefore, following the statement about the blessings of God and the new birth. But James is eminently practical. He comes to those things that you might not immediately think about. And this is an example of, of how he, he teaches us and, and how the Holy Spirit brings to us things that might otherwise be lost on us. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Would that occur to you? A quick hearer? or a slow to speak person, or a slow to wrath person. These are very, very practical things, aren't they? And they have to do with ordinary life, the way that we interact with each other, the way that we are in this world, but also, of course, in how that we interact with God. And even that, perhaps, is the more important thing. Swift to hear is the first thing. Slow to speak is the second. 
and slow to th wrath is the third. So first of all, swift to hear. You'll notice, incidentally, there's a kind of rhythm here, isn't there? Swift, slow, slow. Swift to hear. One old writer has pointed out there's a lesson in numbers in all that James brings out here. The ears and the mouth, or the tongue. God has given us two ears, but only one mouth. And the mouth is multi-purpose. But what can you do with your ears except listen? More important then, this was the deduction that was drawn by numbers, more important to listen than to speak. We're very quick to talk, very quick to come to conclusions and form our opinions, but we should do so only after we have been quick to hear, swift to hear. It means, of course, to be eager to listen, to be patient in hearing, to be careful in hearing, that we hear what's being said, that we patiently wait for the end of that which is being said, and that we come, especially when it's God that's speaking, with an eagerness to hear what God the Lord shall say. But even on a, on a natural level, when we're with each other, or we're out there in the world, it teaches us, doesn't it, that we should hear people, hear them out, before jumping to conclusions. Listen to all that needs, has to be said before we form our opinions. We can do so much damage and cause so much confusion, can't we? Because we, we hear half a sentence and we're not patiently waiting for the rest of it and uh, we jump to a conclusion, we, we form an opinion very quickly and, and uh, it can be very possible that that conclusion is not the right one. So even on that kind of level, James is telling us something quite important. But swift to hear the word of God. Um, in verse 18, James calls it the word of truth. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. In verse 21, he calls it the engrafted word. These are all expressions that describe the word of God. And we are be, to be swift to hear the word of God. And for a number of reasons, I'll just give you two really, we owe it to God to hear him. He has a right to a hearing. Um, we've got our thoughts and opinions about different things and our views, but who are we? You know, do we are we experts? Are we specialists? Do we know everything? Can we call the world to listen to us because we're the last word in whatever it might be? Well, doubtful. And have we got that reputation that demands a hearing? Doubtful. But what of God? Doesn't he demand a hearing? Isn't it his world? Aren't we his creatures? And if we're believers, aren't we his people? Even a parent would be aghast at a child that didn't stand still to listen to what the parent said and how we should be very careful, swift to hear the word of God because we owe it to him as our maker first of all but if we've been brought to that new birth that uh, we've been thinking about here in verse 18 or how we owe it to him to listen to his word then what shall my God say? What does my Saviour have to say to me? We pick up our Bibles at home or we come to the Lord's house on a Lord's day. What will God say to me? What is it in his heart to speak to me? What truth will he impart to me? What blessing has he got in store? Perhaps he might rebuke me, but if he does, I need it. Perhaps he might encourage me and I praise him for that. But whatever it is that God has to say, I owe it to him to hear his word. We owe it to the Lord to hear him, but then, I've alluded to this in a sense already, but the word of God is good. Does God ever say anything to his believing people 
that is not good? Does he say anything to anybody that is not good? Even when he accuses somebody of some gross sin and brings it to their conscious attention, isn't that for their good because it will bring them to repentance? When he lays somebody low, when he punctures their pride and brings them down to the dust as it were and and makes them feel for the first time that in spite of all that they ever thought and claimed, they're actually nothing. Isn't that a good thing? To be humbled like that? The safest place to be is on the ground before God because you can't fall any lower than that. And then when we come to the Gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are some people that, that think that uh, you shouldn't preach the gospel when only Christians are present. I don't agree with that. If we're Christians, I think we always ought to enjoy and relish hearing the gospel. You know, as that hymn puts it, the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Can we tire of that? Swift to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But perhaps we've never believed. Perhaps we've never really turned to Christ well, if, if salvation is the important thing that the scriptures represent it to be, shouldn't we be swift to hear it? Swift to find out what it really means? Swift to give our attention and our devotion to hearing the word of God? After all, in verse 18, it says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. How does the, how does the new birth come? By the word of truth. It's hearing the word. Hearing the word of God, prayerfully and humbly, that brings us to the new birth. And the new birth is that which brings us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So be swift to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything and everything that God would say to us, we should be swift to hear. He demands and deserves a hearing. And when he speaks, it's forever and always for our good. Swift to hear, slow to speak. James has got more to say about the tongue and our speech in chapter 1, verse 26, and in chapter 3, verses 5 and following. Slow to speak. It doesn't say never speak, but slow to speak. It implies that, for example, when we, we speak to each other, we should be slow in the sense of thinking perhaps and reflecting before we speak. As I say, not never speaking, it'd be a strange world if we never spoke, but when we speak with one another, to, to think and to reflect upon what we say, to be circumspect, prudent and wise in our speech. Ask, is this true? Is this helpful? Is this the right time? Is this a necessary thing to say? Spoken words, of course, are only an expression of what is already in the mind. Now that's really where we need to, to be on the watch, to take care about how we think and react within ourselves and what we plan within ourselves before we come out to say anything. Slow to speak to people, but... This sounds rather odd, but slow to speak to God. Now we shouldn't be... Uh, slow to come to prayer but we should be thoughtful and reflective about our prayers that's the real meaning that's here to ask ourselves am I really pray praying along biblical lines not just rushing out with phrases that we might have been familiar with for years, and we do fall into that pattern, don't we? We've always prayed like that. We can even pick up phrases from each other. And it can become a bit of a mechanical exercise and a thoughtless thing. But slow to speak, in other words, reflective, careful. What am I doing here? Am I praying along biblical lines with the right spirit of prayer? Am I praying the full range of prayer that the Lord Jesus taught? Well, we're very quick to bring our petitions. But do we remember praise? The praise of God. 
Do we reflect upon the nature of God and the greatness of God when we pray? Do we bring thanksgiving to God? Are we thinking about all that mighty range of blessings that we've experienced from him through our lives? Do we confess our sins? Do we openly and honestly confess all our sins unto God? Do we plead with the Lord, not only for the petitions that have to do with our daily lives, but for our soul growth? See, slow to speak, ponderous, if you like, thoughtful in, in the way that we pray. What am I praying for? Is it of something that is worthy of God? What is my motive for praying like this? When I pray for a thing, am I willing to accept the Lord's answer? Whatever that answer may be. Slow to speak. Not, not speaking, but not speaking in that rushed, unthoughtful, unconsidered kind of way. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Wrath, of course, means anger. There are different words in the scriptures that have different nuances to them with, with, the, with this matter, but broadly speaking it means anger. There is what we might call a righteous indignation. Paul talks about that in Ephesians. Be angry and sin not. You can be angry without sinning. You can be angry in a righteous kind of way. When, for example, God's name is blasphemed or when his cause is being damaged and there's an awful lot that goes on today that raises the heckles of a, of a, of a righteous man that is concerned for the honour of God. This is the pattern of the Lord Jesus. He had a righteous indignation when he went into the temple and it was full of money changes, people exploiting an opportunity for trade and exploiting the people and charging them exorbitant prices for, for various things for sacrifice and so on. And the Lord Jesus was wrathful, angry about that. He was angry about the ways of the Pharisees at times. And so there is a, a form of righteous indignation, but there is a sinful kind of anger. And James refers to that here. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The kind of wrath that is provoked within us, it hasn't got reference to God, it hasn't got reference to the ways of God, it's got more reference to ourselves and our own nature and our injured pride perhaps and so forth. Slow to wrath, because wrath certainly that runs away with us and overtakes us and changes our ways and our character and our thoughts and our behaviour and our witness and testimony before the world of God. That does not produce, says James, a righteousness that God approves. That's what this means. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Something that is self-centred does not produce a righteousness that God approves of. Slow to wrath, not easily and soon provoked, flaring up with the temper out of control. Wrath. Is wrath justified? That's what the Lord said to Jonah, do you remember? His good was withered. And uh, Jonah was angry. Doest thou well to be angry? Said God, is this a good thing? Have you thought about this? Are you doing a right thing here? By being angry about this matter? A question that we could ask ourselves. And we could go on like this. Is it just hurt pride that, we've, that we're feeling? that has caused this outbreak of wrath. Now put the brakes on and consider this. Is wrath against God possible? Can people, do people, become angry with God? Well, they do in the world. I remember talking to people on more than one occasion. They had deep-rooted bitterness about what had happened in their lives and they blamed it all on the Lord. They were angry with him. Perhaps it is possible to be angry with God, subconsciously perhaps, when things don't go according to our wishes, when things appear unjust 
and unfair. Disappointment can turn into resentment and resentment can become anger. And that's a dangerous thing, it's a harmful thing because when that's true of us, it can paralyze our inward spiritual life and our outward service. How can we be useful to the Lord when we're angry about his dealings with us or we're harboring bitterness and resentment against the way that the world has treated us, things that people might have done and said. Be careful. Quick to hear, swift to hear, says James. Slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. It's a self-watch in response to God's goodness toward us. So how to respond to God's goodness? Well, in those most practical of ways. But then in verses 22 to 25, how to receive God's word? That's what James has brought up there in verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. And he speaks about the word of God Again in verse 21, the engrafted word, as he puts it, the doers of the word, in verse 22, as well as being the hearers of the word. And when God's word comes to us, therefore, how are we to receive it? How are we to respond to it? Well, there are four main things here that I want to bring to you briefly. First of all, we're to receive God's word with a prepared heart. With a prepared heart. You see what he says there in verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. In order to receive the engrafted word, the word of God, the word of God that, that the Lord puts into our hearts, put it simply like that. The first thing we need to do is to prepare the heart, to lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Filthiness is a word that refers to uh, moral dirtiness. Now, we, we think of sin primarily as a breaking of God's law, which it is, of course. It's rebellion against God, breaking God's law, falling short of God's standards and glory. But this word filthiness or moral dirtiness puts a particular view on sin in, an, in another way. It, it, it highlights the, the fact of sin as being an offence that is repulsive to God. It's, just, it's not just a, um, a, 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 a breaking of the law, but it offends him. Now, we, we might break the law of the land, um, but it would be quite unusual for some judge to be moved with great indignity and view us as being repulsive because we broke the speed limit, for example. But when we do anything to, to break God's law, that sin is a repulsive thing. And James' point here seems to be that we should lay apart, to lay to one side, to be rid of all filthiness, all that moral um, and, and sinful offensiveness that is within our hearts. A heart that harbours such things is not in a fit state to receive God's word. It's likely to be repelled and to be rejected if that's what's going on within us. Superfluity of naughtiness, that needs explaining. Um, naughtiness we associate these days with children, with a naughty seat, the naughty corner and so forth. So a, a child that's um, mildly done something that he or she shouldn't have done but it means a great deal more in the original language. It means wickedness, and it means malicious wickedness. And the kind of malicious wickedness that overflows 
this superfluity, that's what it means, overflowing. Overflowing probably he means from the heart and affecting all of the life. Be rid of it, says James. Prepare the heart to receive the word of God. This malicious thinking that can so easily come into our minds. This person that said something, this person that did something, this person that gets under our skin, this person that is a difficult and, and got a contrary kind of character to, to our own and we become, if we're not very careful, we descend into this malicious wickedness, this bitter, resentful spirit, perhaps revengeful and desiring the harm to come to another. These things ought not to be and James says, lay them aside. And this is all part of the preparing to receive the word of God. How can we receive a holy word when our hearts are like that? How can we receive God's, even God's warnings, God rebukes, when, when we're harbouring that sort of an attitude? No, lay these things aside, says James, because these things are sin. That should be enough reason. But they form a barrier, really, to the entrance of God's word and we therefore forfeit God's intended blessing when he seeks to improve us to deepen us to encourage us perhaps to rebuke us all of this is like water off the duck's back and it has no effect if the heart is not prepared recognising sin confessing it and repenting of it so, how to receive God's word? First of all, with a prepared heart, and then with meekness. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word. Meekness means humility. To be teachable. To be pliable. And we need that frame and that attitude to receive the engrafted word implanted into our hearts and into our minds. God brings that word that we might be drawn nearer to him, that we might understand more of him, that we might be moulded into his image. It's always that he speaks with grace in his heart and blessings to bestow upon us. He wants to make us fruitful and then make us more fruitful. He wants to encourage and to increase our Christian graces. And in order for this, the sin that James has been referring to needs to be put out, and we have to have this humble, teachable, pliable spirit to receive the engrafted word. Not to reject it, but to embrace it and to receive it unto ourselves. We need to be teachable. And then thirdly, we're to receive God's word with confidence and an expectation of blessing. And I say that because of what we read at the end of verse 21. To receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Able to save your souls. There's nothing more important and there's no greater blessing than that. The word of God is able to to save our souls because it ever brings us to Christ. To save, as in the gospel itself, it's where we learn about ourselves and where we about learn about the way to God as we looked this morning. I am the way, the truth and the life. That's the gospel, that's the way of salvation. To know Christ, to trust in Christ. And when we come to receive the word, it's a word that is able to bring us to the way of salvation. But more than that, our souls need saving in a different kind of way from that. Saving from hell and saving from heaven, yes. But we need to be saved as well, don't we, from the defilement of our souls. And we get, we, we're, we're living in a world that's rotten and wicked and evil. And it's around us and upon us all the time. And Satan is at our heels all the time. He's tapping us on the shoulder. He's whispering it into our ear all the time. And it's so easy for us to become defiled in our souls, to think wrongly, 
to have wrong wishes, to have wrong attitudes, to have wrong priorities, and our souls become defiled. And it's the Word of God that sets us right. We read something and it brings us up short. It really makes us to realise that we've been slipping and sliding into wrong ways. How often does God's Word have a corrective effect upon us? To save our souls then from defilement and then going on to affect the life and to be saved from decline and backsliding. Oh, this is a very real issue for Christians. We, we become hot, we become cold, we become lukewarm. And we need the Word of God, don't we? And we need the Spirit of God in that Word to revive us and to keep us alive unto God and to restore us from our backslidden ways. Or the Word of God is able to save our souls. So when we come to it, whatever God has to say, be confident and be expectant that God, through that word, has a blessing for us. Maybe a hard lesson, but it'll be a blessing. We'll thank him for it afterwards. It may be a wonderful encouragement, and we'll soon be, we'll soon be thanking him for that. But expect a blessing from the word of God. Pray over it before you read it, and pray over it when you've read it, and expect the Lord to, to speak in that particular and personal way that he loves to do, and we need to have him to do. And then fourthly and finally, we receive God's word with a firm resolve to act upon it. This well-known passage that begins in verse 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now let me just try and bring out the general drift of that. Why does anybody look into a mirror? Why do you look into a mirror when you get ready to go out in the morning? Well, you might do that to admire yourself, I suppose. Um, you might do that to see if you can still recognise yourself. You might, that might be a reason. But generally, it's to check on your appearance, isn't it? Is my hair straight? Have I shaved properly, if we're a man? Have we adorned ourselves suitably, if we're a woman? that kind of a thing, we're checking our appearance. Now, it would be a strange thing, wouldn't it, be to go to the mirror in the morning and notice that your hair is all over the place, dishevelled. If you're a man, you know, you just don't look right. And if you're a woman, you've got um, whatever you put on to make and enhance your appearance. It's, it's all over the place. And instead of making yourself better, you've made yourself worse. And you say, oh, yes, there's, there's all that that's wrong. And then you turn around and walk away and you do nothing about it. Well, you wouldn't do that, would you? Why do we look in the Word of God? Partly, not only, but partly to see what we're really like. And that's what the Word of God does. We look into God's Word and it shows us up for what we really are. It's only someone who is deceived who sees, when he looks into the Word of God, a person that is good, that needs no correcting, no improving, no changes. But when we look honestly into the glass or the mirror that is God's Word, we will see ourselves with emphasised, magnified, obvious faults everywhere. And we will see what God's will is for us that we're lacking, that we're disobeying, that we're neglecting. Are we going to be that foolish as to look into God's word that is there to help, to correct, 
and to improve and then walk away and forget everything that we saw. No changes, no improvements, no laying aside of sin, no walking closer with God, none of those things. It's almost as though we had never looked into the Word of God at all because it's had no effect upon us. And that really is what James is getting at here. Be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. What do we see then in the glass, the mirror of God's Word? What does need doing? What are we conscious of? When we read the Scriptures, do we not hear about or see our sin and our helplessness and our need of a Saviour? Have we done anything about that? Have we repented of our sin? Have we seriously sought the Lord and prayed unto him to be our Saviour and to bear away all of our sin? Have we done that? You know, you can come to the Word of God, you can come to a service and say, well, there's something in that, you know, and I realise I've sinned and I've fallen so far short of God and, and, and how am I going to ever know the Lord and how am I going to find my way to heaven? And then we go up, we get up and we go out and we go away from the Word of God and it's always as though we'd never heard a thing. We'd never seen ourselves under that spotlight of God's Word. Well, enough of that. We need to do something. We need to bring ourselves unto God and pray for His mercy and receive His salvation. Don't we look into God's Word and isn't one of the things that cries out from God's Word when we read of Christ and of the, the, the great saints of old and the way that they lived? Don't we see reflected from God's Word? But don't we see our own shallowness, our spiritual shallowness and superficiality? Don't we see our worldliness? Don't we see how uncommitted we are to the Lord? And we see it over and over and over again. Have we ever done anything about it? Have we ever changed our ways? Have we ever mended the way that we think, the way that we live? We look into God's Word and we see these commands perhaps and we've noted them over and over again but we've said, I'll do this, but I won't do that. And we've refused it. And it's rebellion, rejecting the will of God. Isn't there something that we need to do in that respect? To humble ourselves and put things right. Verse 25 says, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James is so very practical. I should think that to sit under his preaching, we would all be sitting there wriggling in our pews. He wouldn't give us any space to, uh, to make a mistake. We'd know exactly what he was getting at. And... Uh, it's the Spirit of God that needs to bring us to that. And we need ourselves to respond in the right way that we might receive God's Word to God's glory and for our good. Well, may we do that. Amen. Let's sing together our closing hymn. It's number 300.